Good afternoon, viewers, and welcome to The Price of Fame. My name is Lunga Chuka, and I'll be your host. So The Price of Fame is a podcast that focuses on the real stories about the journey to success from the moment of realization of one's gift or purpose. And in these conversations, we aim to share the light on the hardships, the sacrifices, and the mindsets our guests have to overcome to achieve their current position in their career. And these are their stories. Today's guest, ladies and gentlemen, is an award-winning comedian who started his career back in 2011 and has already racked up some heavy hitters in his career. He's won awards, he's done movies, he's hosted a hit TV show on CakeNet, he's also been in ads, he's been part of comedy festivals that has been hosted nationally and internationally. He's put out com a few of his own comedy specials and also featured on a huge comedy special called Trevor Noah's Nation Wild Tour. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome to the screen, Scott Bersadino. Yay! Yeah, please. <laughs> feeling good, feeling positive. Feeling positive. <laughs> Lacker man, yay, yay, my perm, my perm, my mom messed up the perm. <laughs> Leave it to Scott. <laughs> How are you? Buddy? No, I'm good. People always say, Is your neck not sore? And then I, when you when you do that all the time, and I was wondering the other day, like, How is my neck not sore? And then I saw a video of me when I was young, like at a, at a live music show, and I'm like right in the front, and I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've like been waiting for this. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's why. <laughs> now you're making strong. You've been at it. You've been it, Bobby. <laughs> yeah, too many folk of police car concerts. Yo, I remember that band. I only know that one song. Foco, Foco, Politica. Okay. <laughs> it's such a funny song. For those of you who haven't checked it out, please check it out. Uh, I think they are South African band, right? Yeah, 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 the Afrikaans band. Um, it wasn't so funny when that song came out. I think they got like death threats from, well, all the churches. <laughs> but um, yeah. No, it's a cool song. It's a really cool. I remember like banging it in high school most of the time. Be like, oh, this song is so dope. I didn't have issues with, co with, with cops at the time, but I was banging it and I was feeling it. <laughs> all right, Skull. Let's get into it, buddy. Um, yeah. Like I said, like I said in the in the sound check, thank you so much for being a guest on the Price of Fame. It's truly an honor thank to you. have you with us, and thank you for making time. You know, um, cool. how has twenty twenty one been treating you so far? I mean, it's been like if you look at it uh, versus last year, there's been a it's not out of it, but there's been yeah. some adjustments. You know, and within especially in the entertainment industry, we've got um, a lot of people like actors, and some people got a chance to like step on stage here and there, and some people have moved over to the, the online platform side. For you, how has 2021 been treating you? What have you done um, so far? Um, I, I am very cautious to uh, talk about the devastating effect that it had on the entertainment industry because in my case, the pandemic was in many ways beneficial. Of course, I had to also cancel shows and there was a loss of income and I had some very nice international opportunities that I that I had to, to cancel um, or that, that couldn't happen. But in terms of like my, my, my videos on Instagram and stuff like that, it, it doubled my, my Instagram following and my Facebook following. And yes. I mean, as you know yourself, Lunga, like when you sell tickets to shows, those extra followers really help, you know, like, I mean, there's so often be before, before that, like that you would do shows and it was just very frustrating because then you would do a show in Cape Town and then the next week you see people and they go, hey, when are you doing a show in Cape Town again? And then you're like, I was <laughs> last week. But then they didn't know because they don't follow you on Instagram. And that is obviously the new, well, that's that's how you advertise your, your shows at the moment. Well, in, yeah. the, in the new modern age, you know, like you don't really put up posters in, in Cape Town when you do a show. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I haven't really been, Complaining about lockdown because I I have, you know, I kind of made the best out of it, what I could at the beginning. And 
it worked out for me. You know, the videos was something wonderful that I discovered that I, I would never have discovered if it wasn't for, for COVID because um, I, I would always, when I think of funny content, I would never want to use it in a video and put it out for free on Instagram because my mindset was always that, well, I can use this in a show. So why mm -hmm. would I put it out on Instagram? Then people see it. Then I can't use it in a show because then people are going to say, well, I've seen that joke. So, yeah. but then with COVID, it's like, it was like, well, the stuff that we can joke about only stays relevant for a very short amount of time. So if you kind of don't joke about it now uh, yeah. and say something about it now, it's not going to be relevant in six months. So, yes. you know, that's why I started making the videos because I'm like, I'm thinking of funny things to say and I might as well put it out there because, yes. you know, and, and it was, it, it, it generated new fans for me. I mean, there were people that, you know, people don't have a filter, especially not on social media, would send me messages <laughs> going, you know, I didn't like you before. I didn't like you before. But now I actually, I think you're okay. I think you're quite funny. <laughs> and I'm like, thank you and for go also at the same time. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But like, you know what I mean? So um, the, 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 the videos helped a lot with like visibility and... Yeah, it gave me some awesome opportunities. So um, 2021, to answer your question, it's actually not been too cock for me. Yeah. Look, um, like I can fully resonate with what you're saying because um, last week I had an interview with Candace Thornton. And we were also speaking about the effects that we were speaking about as an artist, you know, um, sometimes you need to do things that increases the brand and sometimes you need to do things for the money, you know. So we need to have a health balance. So you... Deciding, you know what, I'm not just going to put this in my show so that people can pay to see it. I'm going to put this out there for free because it's going to help my brand grow. It's going to make me look relevant and make it look like that I'm still here doing my thing, you know. So that was a good move on your brand side. And like you said, it increased your following as well, you know, as opposed yeah, to your as if opposed you, to if your you brand. Thing. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We, you go, you go, you go. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of finished, just like as opposed to your previous mindset where you were like, you know what, I'm going to save this for the show and yeah. people should pay for my artwork, you know, for my hard work and everything like that. And you actually made that flip. And now you understand that these are healthy balance that you should have between the two. And you were saying? Yeah, and I was saying if you increase, if you increase your brand and your visibility, that does, tra the, uh, it does eventually transfer into financial because then more people come to your shows because because of the videos when i did do live shows when it was possible last year and this year in level one so many people came to the show i could see those people have never been to one of my shows and they also yeah. afterwards you know come up to me and they say like wow it's you know it's the first time i've watched one of your shows and why are they there because they watched your videos they enjoyed your videos and also you get you get other bookings that you would have never never otherwise gotten you know now suddenly you're performing uh, at a team building event or christmas party event or whatever because the person who booked you saw your videos and thought oh okay and because you are front of mind for people because they open instagram and there you are yeah if they're thinking okay who should i book for our end of year function you kind of one of the first people they think of just because you're always there, yeah. you know. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I also, you know, was encouraged by other people in my life to, hey, you should do this, you should do online shows. So it wasn't all my thinking. Yeah. It's, it's really the online shows, you know. It's a, it's a friend of mine, Magrit, who, who helps me sometimes with my social media, like making the ads and stuff for shows. She said, you should do online shows. I said to Magrit, I don't know. It's going to be cock awkward. No laughs, no faces. Yeah. Be on the screen. She said, do it. Do one. If it's cock, don't, don't do another one. And yeah. you know, I did that one. It did feel a bit cock. But then afterwards, you know, I checked my phone and my DMs were blowing up. People just like, wow, thank you. That was so like, we enjoyed it. Don't worry. We were here. We were laughing. Even if you couldn't see it. Um, yeah. And I was like, okay. And then I ended up doing like eight, eight of them. You know, it was awesome. <laughs> From now, I don't know, to my eight. <laughs> no. It's a huge jump. But like, um, I just wanted to take it back to something that you said, you know, eventually it translates into a money, like a monetary value because also yeah. with social 
social media, even them not coming to your shows, with your followers increasing, you will, at some point you'll be verified, right? And then that's when you um, you start getting paid for your content that comes out and that kind of thing, you know? So like being verified on, on, on yeah. Instagram or, or, or on YouTube. I, I haven't figured out the get paid paid button yet, <laughs> but yeah. I think... I think it is possible, but what happens then is they they play ads in your in your videos, okay. like same as YouTube, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you have this huge following and this huge traction, so they were like, ah, let's throw our ad. So they're basically just riding on your wave, no? But yeah, like, but you, uh, you have to you have to you have to say, okay, cool, I accept the ads, and then I'll get paid. But yeah, I don't know, I don't I don't feel comfortable with ads in my video. Like just before you get to the punchline, now there's a <laughs> <laughs> by, the time you, you, <laughs> by the time you get your punchline pe people are like what what was the setup again <laughs> yeah yeah it messes up the flow yeah I, I can picture that maybe it will better with skits if you're doing like a skit and that's yeah. fine you know but not yeah. with comedy actually following and um also another thing that you actually brought to my attention is that on the social platforms you can reach so much more people like for example yeah. take that show that you did maybe 50 or 60 people, or, or that's a 100 seater. You sell out a 100 tickets. That's good. Mm. But you go on social media and you have like a 1,000 people tuning in, you know? And yeah. like you say, from different places, the people that have never, ever seen you, because most likely the people coming to your show know about you already, and they've seen mm. you and they want to support you. But now you're finding on social media, you're, you're reaching so many other people who have, haven't heard you, and they're just like, okay, who's this guy, you know? Oh, he's actually funny. And like you say, they eventually come to the show afterwards and be like, I saw your thing and I thought I want to come yeah. check it out. That is so awesome. Especially with the online shows, you know, because it I was doing 50 Rand tickets, but then it's for the household. You get, you get a link and then you obviously yes. play the show there on the TV or the laptop and the whole family can watch. So then yes. what would happen is only Booty sitting there is a fan of yours. But he, yes. they're a family of six, you know. So he says, hey, guys, I bought a 50 Rand ticket for this comedian I like. And yeah. now the family's like, oh, okay, we'll watch it. But in the process of them watching it, they go, oh, okay, he's actually funny. Now, at the end of your show, not only Booty is a, 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 a fan, but like Booty, yeah. Sissy, Mama, Papa, you know. Now suddenly when you do a live show in their town or their city, they're like, hey, let's all go, you know. Let's all four of us go. Now, that's four tickets that you're selling in the future. Um, yeah. Instead of just where it would have just been you on. Yeah. Now, yeah. I need to take some notes. I need to take some notes because I'm still in that mindset. Like, I don't know about this online thing, you know. I don't know. I don't know. But I need to take some notes. I think, I mean, that perspective is really a good perspective. And I think I should try it out. I mean, like, you tried it. Who knows, you know, I should also put myself out there. So, yeah, I need to yeah. pick up my boots. <laughs> it's, obviously, just... it's obviously cock, you know, at the first one or two, you know, but I mean, and uncomfortable, but your first live gig was also weird and uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, yeah. I, mean, I mean, not yours, I mean us, you know, like, so <laughs> your first one is weird. Your second one is better. Your third one, okay, you're getting the groove. And it's the same with the online shows. You, In a way, you were starting from, from scratch again. The first one was for me was weird. The second one, I was like, okay, I, there's something here. Third one, okay, I'm getting the hang of it. By the fourth, fifth, sixth one, I was actually having fun. I was like, this is awesome. I love it. And there's yeah. a comment section. And it's it was just a new way of doing it. But it was like, I'm reaching people. That's awesome. People are there. They're, they're watching. They're laughing. Even though you can't see and hear them, it just actually became a trust exercise. I just have to trust that what I'm saying is funny and that people are there somewhere yeah. and laughing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Man, um, before we move on to the, the next questions, I just want to talk a little bit about that ad that I just seen. I think it's, I think it's the latest ad that you've done. Uh, it's like a video game kind of vibes with a uh, with a dog, Puiki. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Oh, that's such a cool ad, man. I thought it was actually a video game, but it's something else. It, the the brand is completely something else. How was that for you doing that experience? Yeah, man, it was cool. I I I like doing ads. You know, if the ad is, I think people, some people will see ads as like something you just do for the money and you're selling your soul a bit and whatever, but. If it's a funny ad and it's an ad that fits in with 
your your brand then there's there's no reason why an ad can't also just be an extension of your art you know what That's i mean a- there's like i don't know i i can't think of like a, <laughs> suddenly of a good example now but like you know there's 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 a lot of ads that famous actors are in that you don't it doesn't come across as like oh like this person got paid a million dollars <laughs> that's why he did it or she did it you know yeah. it's like it fits in so i'd really try and choose the ads that i do wisely and okay. make yeah because the last thing you want is to do something for the money and then it goes out there and then you cringe every time you see it or when someone mentions it okay. then then it's like well was it then even worth the financial you know is it worth is it worth it financially if like emotionally and if it does yes. damage to like your brand then yes. you know the, then the money starts looking worse and worse yeah. you know so um but but yeah if you, if you, i guess you you reach a point where you're in a position where you go okay like cuz they like at what point does it become greed you know the mm-hmm. money like eventually it's like okay I, i've paid my bills this month yeah so that's what i always try and keep in mind it's like when i've reached the point where i've paid my bills right my debit orders can come off then i'm like okay well whatever extra money i earn on top of this needs to be stuff that i want to do and that i'm proud of okay like you know so obviously if it's a case of because you don't always have that luxury so obviously if you in a in a in a place where you're like yo i've got debit orders coming off in 5 days and i've got nothing then yes sell your soul get just whatever <laughs> you need to do get the money in the bank but <laughs> but you know the, the yeah there's a point where you go like no i'm 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 fine for the month i can get through this month or the next few months so now i'm going to if i do this thing that i'm ashamed of that i just did for the money then it was actually more greed than anything else because it didn't it only benefited you in your pocket and it you know and you need to try and always i think at least if i think you need to always try and put your your art before the money that's why it's such an amazing story and that people love that story of Dave Chappelle turning down the 50 million dollars that comedy central offered him to do the second season of Chappelle show because he couldn't have um full control Mm. full creative freedom so yeah. it was like yeah i mean if if he was broke didn't have a cent to his name then sure maybe he would have done it but he was like i'm fine financially would the 50 yeah. million dollars be nice yes of course it's a lot of money but what what am i sacrificing then so you know like so 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 the, it's always like that balance i mean you you saying in in terms of like the balance between building your brand and fin- fi- finances um we can't ignore the fact that we need to make money because we also just people operating in an economy we have to yeah. we have to pay <laughs> for cock <laughs> yeah and but it's always that i feel it's always that balance between finances and artistic integrity you know mm-hmm. so where do you eventually give up your artistic integrity for the money because the thing is if you do the thing for the money once it goes out there it's out there and then if it whether it's a movie a series whatever and then if it's cock you need to live with that that the money is going to run out but the movie is going to stay there forever people will be able to go watch that cock movie you did forever <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah no yeah 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 it's 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 be like this also was a, a part of a conversation now that I had with another guest also we were also speaking about knowing your values you know how where do you draw the line you know when you're doing things and when you're choosing um things to do or projects to do or roles to play you know so mm-hmm. and i guess you learn with also experience you know something yeah. that you you know 
is like reading a book and be like, I know what to do and what to choose. You learn with experience. You learn how, okay, this actually damages the brand or this uplifts the brand in that kind of way. But Skulk, yeah. with comedy with you, my brother, can you please tell us, I know I mentioned that it started in 2011. But can you tell us where the bug actually really bit you? I know you took your, your career seriously in 2011, but when did the bug bite you when you felt like, you know what, this is what I want to do. This is who I want to be the rest of my life. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I'm not sure the moment where it like really bit, but I think once I, maybe once I started doing it full time, because for the first five years, four years, no, yeah, five years of my career, I was also studying at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I was doing stand-up, you know, but there would be like two, sometimes two or three months where I don't do any stand-up at all because, you know, I'm studying. Yeah. Um, and, you know, then when things calm down with my studies or when it's the university holidays, then I would gig again as hard as I could. Um but I think once I started doing it full time and actually started living that lifestyle of like, OK, this is what it's like to be a full time comedian. You know, that's when I, I think that's when it like really the bug bit. And I was like, wow, this is really amazing. It's amazing to have this lifestyle. It's amazing to be your own boss. It's harder work because, you know, if you have a boss to a certain extent, um, you know, if shit goes down in the company, you as the employee, you're like, well, I mean, talk to the boss. I don't know. But, um, you know, with you, it's like yeah, there's, the there's, there's obviously advantages and disadvantages to being your own boss. But, um, yeah, I then I was like, well, this is this is awesome to be able to be as busy as you can and then take time off if you want. You know, yeah. and 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 it's it's so exciting all the time. There's it, there's really there's never a dull moment because especially now in the pandemic, it's like, okay, level one, four, go 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 go, show 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 as much as we can. Yeah. Boom, close down. Okay, cool. What else? You like you're always hustling. There's always like new opportunities. There's always stuff that you do that you never thought you would do. Um, yeah. You you know like interesting opportunities coming along in the entertainment industry. So, yeah, no, I, I think once I started actually living the lifestyle properly in like, you know, living the lifestyle of a, of a freelance comedian, I was like, yeah, this is, this is cool. And also one man shows kind of changed the game for me a bit. Um, you know, being, to, being able to make that jump from, headlining club gigs to actually doing one man's where you can do a week at a theater and it's, it's you, that's the show, you know, that, that is an amazing feeling. I, I'll never get bored of that. I'll never get used to it. That's so awesome, man. And yeah. like, um, did, did you have any challenges, you know, in the beginning, like when you were starting to break out into your, your craft and becoming a comedian, what were your challenges like? What did you find difficult, you know, with the industry? And also, can you comment on, um, like, you, you've you hustled in Cape Town and Joburg as well, right? And among artists, there's always this, like, ah, you need to go to Joburg if you want to make money, or you know, Cape Town is this, Cape Town is lazy, Joburg. In your own experience and your own opinion, um, can you describe what is, what's the difference between Cape Town and Joburg with the hustling of comedy? And also... <laughs> But before, Yo. but before we get to that, but before we get to that, can you tell us a little bit about the challenges, you know, with growing, uh, with growing into the community, and then you link it into the, to the difference between Cape Town and Joburg, the, the entertainment industry. Um, okay, challenges. Well, I think for any young comedian, I, I don't think I had any challenges that were unique to me. Um, you know, I think what my challenges were are the challenges or were the challenges of any open spot comedian. Um, the fact that you're hustling for gigs, there's not enough gigs, um, you know, in Cape, well, in, in South Africa in general, there's not enough gigs that you can do five minutes every yeah. night. Somewhere. There's not enough gigs that you can do multiple gigs in a night. You know, like you always hear these stories of like these New York 
comedians and it's so it sounds so incredible because they do four sets in a night because those comedy clubs are so huge so you're doing yeah. the big room then you run down the stairs then you do the small room then you run across the road and there's another fucking comedy club that also has three rooms then you do each yeah. of those rooms and they gig from like 7 p.m until like their last set they do it like two in the morning you know but that's just the industry they have there so you know it was like being being like hungry to gig and hungry to get stage time but it's like this thing holding you back the whole time because it's like yeah you do a gig and then it's like when can i come back in two weeks because <laughs> there's a lot of guys who want stage time and i can't have the same people every week um yes. or three weeks or whatever that was the one challenge and then i guess the other challenge was just like writing finding my voice you know when you when you when you start out you kind of trying to mimic certain comedians which i think is fine you need to like mimic and copy here and there not copy material but copy styles yes of <clears throat> comedians do you like so that you yeah. can eventually find a way to your own voice um yes. you know so you know and writing new material was hard because you know i get i i get very bored with my material after a few months of doing it and then i start like i wouldn't say hating it or resenting it but you know then then the pressure builds like just why can't i, I don't want to do this joke again i've done this joke now <laughs> <laughs> and can I just think of a new joke and then you can't and oh it's hard but anyway um that I guess is something that will never end um yeah <clears throat> yeah and and Cape Town and Joburg I'm trying to really think I I think one thing that I picked up in Joburg mm -hmm. uh when I started gigging here because you know the whole time I've now eventually moved here after being uh in Cape Town for the first eight years of my of my career but you know because I am from Joburg so always in the unit uh, yeah in the university holidays I'd come to Joburg and gig you know because okay. I came home I couldn't be in res so I came home and gigged so I was like in between my studies gigging in Cape Town and then the winter holidays and the summer holidays June July December January gig in Joburg and something I always noticed in Joburg was that the comedians I felt more regularly had new material like I would see guys in June and July doing a set see them again in December doing a brand new set mm -hmm. um, I don't know if the industry is maybe a bit more competitive here and it's just that hustle like people felt like well if i want to stay relevant and i want to compete with these other guys i need to write i need to have new stuff you know otherwise you're going to kind of fade into the fade into the background and i guess it's also it 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 sort of has a knock on domino effect because it only takes one guy to go on at a gig and do a blazing new 10 minute set for the other six comedians in the room they they get it you get inspired by that you go shit you know i somewhere like feel feel less to go right tonight or <laughs> think of something new because what that guy did tonight just it looks so lacquer it looks so nice to just have a new exciting 10 minutes you can see it's exciting for the audience because it's exciting for the comedian yeah. you know you can pick it up if the comedian has is doing a joke that they've done for years because they're not having fun with it anymore it's sort of yes. like the, the the light in their eyes have died a bit when they tell that joke they just kind of like gloss over you know and it's hard it's hard to have the same that level of excitement um you know so i think that was for me something that i noticed yeah and and, and other comedians as well like when other comedians came to joburg to gig for a week They'd always come back to Cape Town and be like, "Yo, you yeah, see, everyone, everyone just had new material, and everyone was so funny, you know." And I'm like, "Yo, well, you know, it's fucking. That's the cock part of the job, <laughs> is to write. That's not fun. The fun part is to go on stage and get all the love." Yes, <laughs> but you have to do the writing and the research first, eh? Yeah, yeah.
And with um with with the household, you know, with 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 your family, you you moving into comedy, and as well as your peers, and just like your 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 community, um, where you grew up, was there things like um challenges like gangsterism, drugs, and all of that things that you kind of had to dodge or stay away from, or anything that was kind of like in your face, but you had to stay strong. Uh, did you have any challenges like that in your community and in the household? How was your people, how was your folks about you moving into comedy? You know, did they support you all the way or did they only come onto the ship or they're like, oh, okay, we can see that you're doing something good here. And then did they like kind of like ease up on you or how has it been? Yeah, I mean, look, firstly, growing up, um, you know, I grew up sort of like Afrikaans, suburban, you know, they, 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 I definitely can't say there was gangsterism or any things like that. In terms of drugs, I think in all communities, whether you're from the, even if you like from the richest suburbs, there's kids doing, you know, from Lani schools doing cocaine and experimenting with drugs. Yes. So I think, I think obviously in certain communities, it's more prominent. I never had issues with drugs. They would obviously be now and then at a house party where someone would offer you uh, a, a joint or, you know, in the comedy industry, you add a gig and another comedian offers you a line of Coke, um, you know, and I mean, I think it's up to every person to kind of navigate that world and to find the balance and to not get sucked into it because luckily I also had, um, I guess, enough friends and colleagues and if you can call it that i don't know that that had bad experiences with it that you could see the effect that it actually had on them so that you can go okay yo this is actually like a serious thing yeah. um yeah. you know but no i wouldn't I, I would not say it was like a challenge that i had to overcome or that i had to purposefully dodge you know yeah. it's, it's not like i was ever faced with that uh, a lot my family, um, my, I'm an only child, so it's my, my parents, basically. They they at first did not like the swearing. Um, <laughs> yeah. They, 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 they're not super conservative, but they didn't yeah. like the swearing. Also, I will say this, in their defense, I did swear more when I was starting than I, than I do now because yeah. you're still then so nervous when you go on stage and that it does become a crutch. It does become a coping mechanism. Like you, you not thinking fast enough of the next sentence. So you're using swear words to buy yourself to to make the sentence longer, to buy yourself more time to think, oh, what is the next joke here? And also, yeah, when you when you sometimes swearing gets a laugh. You know, it's not like a it's a cheap laugh, but sometimes yeah. it gets a laugh. So sometimes you go fuck, and then people go, <laughs> uh, and then you like. Oh, okay, cool. You know, and then it becomes a coping mechanism. So when you're gigging and it's not going well, then suddenly I found myself swearing more and more and more because it's like, maybe if I swear more, they'll laugh, you know. Um, <laughs> now that you, now that I'm like, oops, now that I'm more like, um, you know, comfortable on stage, now I really try and only use swear words where it really is emphasizing something or improving a joke um yeah. but but yeah so they didn't like it at the beginning but you know a mother they are just proud people you i could you could be saying the dirtiest cock on stage if your mom is in the audience and she's looking around her and seeing people laugh and seeing that you are bringing that laughter and happiness to people they will be proud that's what yeah. happened with my mom eventually you know she started coming to gigs and and she's looking around and she's like, wow, people are enjoying this, especially obviously the gigs that you really kill, you know, that's awesome. And then your mom's like, wow, you know, like, hey, they, they love him, <laughs> you know, and then she becomes proud. Then you can, it doesn't matter. Then you can be talking about blowjobs, doesn't matter. She, <laughs> your mom will be like, yeah, that's my son. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> I, I don't know. Your theory, though, I don't know if I want to test it, but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> I don't no, think all of them are the same. <laughs> yeah, um, they are. She, she, she still gives me notes after every show, though. She comes to oh, the okay. show, 
and and it's still like the some of the dirty jokes she she doesn't like um you know but she also has like weird standards like they would sometimes be like a really dirty joke that i think she will hate and then she didn't mind that joke but then there's a joke that i didn't even consider dirty and then she's like yeah that one i didn't like it was weird no that one was a bit too far then i'm like that was not even as bad as the other thing i said <laughs> That's so funny. Skulk, was there ever a moment in your career where you felt like, you know what, this is too much for me right now. I just want to hang up my boots and I don't know when I'm going to pick it up, but I just need to be Skulk for myself now. Did you ever have a moment like that where you kind of felt like, you know, I, I don't want to use the word depression, but like where you felt like I'm in this dark space or dark phase and it's really difficult for me now. And I actually just need some proper support now and not to be Skulk. Did you ever have an experience like that? And what brought you out of it? Uh, no, no. I think I think comedy is the thing that keeps me out of that space. Because okay. comedy is really my, my like almost like my identity, I feel. Like I don't I don't know who I am without comedy. Yeah. Like if comedy had to stop suddenly stop existing, then you know, I don't know. So I think I think the fact that I always am performing and doing comedy, whether it's on stage or making an Instagram video, you know that that's me. Um, so that that actually keeps me from depression, and because that is like absolutely my happy place. You know, I don't I don't see. Obviously, you have like tough gigs that that feel like work, like when you really have to like fight the audience to laugh, but. Yeah. When I'm doing a one-man show and I'm on stage for an hour and a half and I'm doing material that I'm proud of, people are laughing, then that that does not feel like work to me. That that feels like relaxation. That is my yeah. watching TV. That is like for me so relaxing. Like I'm just so I for, stress gone, everything, you know, and then people come up to me after the show and they say, Yo, you must be tired. And then I'm like, no, I want a party now. Like, let's go. Now I'm like energized. Yeah. That was awesome. I was like, I'm not saying the show. I'm just saying like I was on stage for an hour and a half and people were, were laughing. That's that's, yeah. that's great, you know. So um obviously there are dips that you go through in life. Um, but then I would say comedy is always my saving grace to help me out of those dips. Um Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it's I, important. I can... to, it's important to. Um, sorry for interrupting you. It's important to embrace those dark moments as well. I think. Um, yes. Don't don't go on purpose revel in it or sit in it. But yeah. when it comes, just acknowledge it, and there's no use in trying to just ignore it or push it away and pretend it's not there. Like let mm -hmm. it come in. Deal with it and and move on. Yeah. So, I mean, like it, it's 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 an it's the thing is that we're emotional beings and we experience emotions, you know, good and bad. And sometimes people think like, no, I'm only gonna stick to the good emotions, you know, and ignore the bad emotions or ignore all of these things. But once you grow, you know, you understand that there is it's part of you, it's just as much as the good is part of you, like the yin and the yang. Like you're saying, don't just ignore it, acknowledge it embrace it, see how you feel about it, and what lesson is it actually trying to teach you? Because most of the times, when you feel like you're in a, um, um, in a rat or something like that, there's usually a lesson to learn or a different direction that you need to take, you know? So the more that we look at it with that perspective, uh, the quicker we can then grow from it, as opposed to staying in that old bubble and being like, oh, you know, today's just another day, it's gloomy and all of that kind of thing. So, it's, so I like what you said, um, embrace it, you know? Look at it, see you, ask it, what, what what am I supposed to learn from this, you know, and then move on, pick yourself up. And that's so awesome that you actually use comedy to take, to keep yourself on there. So comedy is something that people would turn to when they're in a space like that as well, you know. Yeah. And I mean, uh, in my new Afrikaans show, I have this this one joke about that, like, sometimes it's it's really nice to just, like, have a day where you feel sorry for yourself. You know, because people <laughs> always say, don't feel sorry for yourself. Yes, Sometimes yes, yes. you just need one of those days where you're just pathetic, where you just 
<laughs> feel so sorry for yourself and oh everyone hates me and uh, like have those days that's fine sometimes it's like just like feel like sorry for yourself and you know just be the victim that day and then yeah. the next day you can like kind of or do it for a week if it's going to make you feel better but um yeah so a quick way uh see there's a comment there oh like a king do you find yourself always chasing the laughter and or does it ease up the more you do it? Hmm. Skull? No. I, <laughs> I think it will hopefully still ease up in the future. But at this moment, I'm still chasing the laughter. Yeah, I don't think you ever, you, you, you ever like, yeah, you know what, I got this, you know, because you never know, it's always different crowds, so it's always that nervousness and you don't know if you can do good. Uh, we should wrap up really, really soon because my time is running out, but it's, it's just three more questions I want to ask you. My yeah. third, first question is that with your drama, I mean, you study drama and acting, right? Do you feel like that has given you a huge push in stage performance and just knowing how to do and in, in your comedy? Or do you feel like it's a completely diff uh, different ball game? Yeah, I'm glad you said that. I, I, all, I, from the start, I saw it as just two art forms, two different art forms, like, like painting and dancing. Okay. Because I feel if you if you are too much of an actor on stage in your stand up, then yeah. you take away some of that magic that stand up comedy is, which is that. It's not acting. It's not a character. It's me. It's I'm listening to the person. Yes. You know, that's why people come to watch stand-up. I wrote my uh, honest thesis on stand-up comedy. And, you know, this. I read this book that this guy wrote on stand-up comedy. And he had, such, he had such a beautiful line. It's so simple. He said, if I want to see acting, I'll go watch a play. It's yeah. a simple example. No one is coming to watch stand-up comedy to watch you act. They're yeah. coming to connect with a person. They want to know your opinions, your stories, your emotions. They want to see you. I want to come watch Lunga. I don't want to come watch the character that Lunga is trying to portray, the Lunga that he is trying to give the world. I want to see the real Lunga, you know? And that's why, especially now in the, in the lately, those comedy specials have been on Netflix have been so prominent, the ones where, the comedians get real because it's yeah. like, wow, this is like, you know, it's funny, but it's also real. And that is what stand up is. So, and, and, and the same thing in, in, in acting, I was also lucky that my lecturers always pushed me because sometimes I would go a bit into my comedian skulk on stage and they would always say to me, be careful because I can see comedian skulk now yeah. acting the fool. You know, and mm -hmm. you're a character. You're not Skulk now. Yeah. Take away the comedian Skulk because the comedian Skulk comes out because he wants to, you know, he knows comedian Skulk gets a reaction from the audience. And it's like, no, don't play for the laughs or the reaction or whatever. Yes. What is true to the, the character? You want people to not see Skulk when you're acting. Yes. They must forget about Skulk when, when you're acting. So I've always tried to completely separate the two as much as I can. I think there are probably ways in which one helps the other, but I try and kind of see it as like, now I'm a comedian and I'm, I'm not an actor. Now I'm an actor and I'm not a comedian. You know, yeah. like just try and, yeah. Dude, I've had that experience once. I went for a casting and um, they told me to play this role. For example, they say, drink this cool, drink, take a sip of the beer, you know, and then like give us a reaction like, ah, you don't like this. So me being comedic, me, I like, uh, uh, you know, and they're like, no, no, yeah. no, it's too much, you know? <laughs> yeah. And they're like, because that's not how you would really act. You would just be like, Ugh, you know? So then yeah. you must say, oh, not, not the comedian now. I must just yeah. be the actor. A character now so the character wouldn't go like that but lunga would go uh, all of that craziness you know yes, yes, so, yes. Uh, i understand where you have to kind of like differentiate the two when you bring in this and when you bring in that but i do feel there are some fundamental core values that you can that that you have that helps you for example with stage presence or how to perform or how to project your voice and when you're performing to a crowd those little things you know you take with you from your acting and drama, I suppose, and how, and how to be aware of the stage, you know, all of that things. Yeah, that, that kind of stuff does help, yes. Because I've, I've done a show once where, you know, um, the power cut, 
Yeah. And then I was like, okay, well, you know, I put the mic down. I'm like, okay, well, you know, this is how I'll do the rest of the show. And my yeah. acting training helped me that I could like, you know, push my breath from my stomach and project to the back of the room, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, if I didn't have that training, I wouldn't have maybe reached the people in the back. So yes, in, in those ways, it, it does, it does help you a lot. Okay. Uh, I'm running out of time, but I still want to steal more time from you. Go, 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 go. <laughs> Skulk, okay, last two questions. Before I mention that, I'm looking at you now and I can't stop seeing Charlie Chaplin. Has anyone ever told you that you look like Charlie Chaplin? Like you just need the hat. You just need the hat right now. You got the mustache and everything. You just need the hat and Charlie Chaplin, boom. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if they if they one day make a, a Charlie Chaplin movie, I'm I'm down. Charlie Available. Um, I, Charlie Chaplin. Uh, I, I have been told that and yeah that's a huge compliment thank yeah, you absolutely um okay last, second last question before we go have you had any mentors in your careers anyone that you've seen as like a mentor who's kind of like help you along the way and is there anyone that you have mentored along the way you know what I that is what I really love about the comedy industry is I feel like so many comedians I've worked with have been mentors, even if it was just like one thing that someone said to me once at a gig, sometimes yeah. older comedians, sometimes younger comedians, sometimes comedians who are more experienced, sometimes comedians who are less experienced yeah, because yeah. It's, such a, it's such a collaborative industry. And, you know, people, people have also asked me like my friends outside the comedy industry, they, they, they say to me, um, it must be a very co competitive industry, you know? And, and I said, you know what, actually not like, I feel like in our, in our industry, people are comedians are genuinely happy for, for each other. Of course, there's always the exception, but like <laughs> when someone succeeds and gets a great opportunity, other comedians are like tweeting and celebrating and sharing and going like, well done, bro. You know, people like we celebrate each other because we know like a comedian doing well, in a way, does well for the industry. Yes. Trevor Noah getting The Daily Show shines more light on South African comedians in general. Now, suddenly, people are going, okay, I didn't know there was even comedians mm -hmm. in South Africa. That's interesting, you know. Yeah. Now, when you go overseas, like when I went to Edinburgh, suddenly, I'm getting so much more respect saying, like, hey, I'm a comedian from South Africa because people really go, oh, my word, Trevor Noah's from South Africa, you know. Yeah. Because now, now you know, be, before him, it would be like, where, where are you from? You know, yeah. so, um, yeah. So uh, I've, I've had a lot of, a lot of mentors. I haven't had like one person that has been, you know, and I also don't have one person that I've been mentoring yeah. or something like that. But it's like, you can, you can always count on your, your com comedy, your friends in comedy to call them up you know, at any time and be like, hey, man, I need your advice on this. Hey, yeah. man, like, what would you have done in this situation? I'm struggling to write. Can we go have a beer and, like, yeah. talk yeah. about writing or, or whatever, you know? Yeah. Awesome, man. Skull, and last but not least, um, I like to put you in my time machine and I'm going to take you back to the Skulk of today. Having no, having walked the, the journey that you've walked and all the knowledge and everything, take you to a time machine to a very, very young skulk starting out comedy, taking it serious for the very first time. What piece of advice would you leave for the younger version of you? Uh, I'm going to get in your time machine. I'm going to take it even further back to young skulk starting to develop a passion for, for drama. You know, okay. starting to develop a passion for acting and performing and so on. Because, you know, I, and I, in my new show, Feeling Good, I, I, I really explore this kind of in a way that I haven't explored it on stage, like kind of where I wanted to get it like a bit, bit real. Because um, yeah. I was like bullied in school, you know, and I wouldn't say it's like uh, but it didn't get to a point where I was – you know, crying myself to sleep every night, but it was tough and it was cock and it does have an impact on you. And, mm -hmm. you know, it starts creating this, um, 
this idea as a young boy that you have to play sports or you have to have you know be fit or you have to be like physical in or it's in order to be a man you know yeah. because if you if you i was called morphe a lot in in uh, primary school you know and morphe if the people watching who don't know is a derogative term for a gay man it's basically the afrikaans version of faggot so yeah. it's it's a really horrible word you know and and you're like, why am I being called this? You know, because yeah. and I, I explained this in my new show is that it didn't mean gay because we didn't even know what gay was. It didn't mean mm. people of the same sex loving each other. It didn't mean that. Yeah. It, was, it was more a word that said that you are not a boy the way we are boys. Yeah, we are boys yeah. and then you, and it was confusing because you're like, I'm not a girl. Uh but I'm not a boy, so that what you know, what am yeah. I? Yeah. So um, you know, I wish I could just go to that skulky, skulky, and uh, just say, you know, it's it's fine, it's okay, you know, this is just the how people view it, you know, the, this is this is society, you know, the rugby players, they are the the real boys, and then the the drama boys, they are the Morphe's or the, the airy fairy boys or whatever you want to call it, the sensitive boys. Yeah. Um, but I wish I could just go to Skull Kid and say, you're, you're, you're a boy the same way everyone else is a boy and you will grow up to be a man in the same way that these other boys will grow up to be a man. You're not the yeah. same type of man because, you know, I'm not, I'm not like a – sort of big, burly, manly man that, you know, yeah, it's big yeah. and strong, but I'm still a man, you know, yeah. just a different different version or different type, I guess, whatever you yeah. want to call it. So, um, but it doesn't make you less of a man. So like all men are men and all women are women. And they within that, there's variations. Yeah. Um, you know, with women, you get girly girls and you get tomboys. Is a tomboy... A man, no, she's a woman, just like the girly girl, but it's just, just a different type or taste or whatever you want to call it. So, um, yeah, that's that would be my message. Sorry to end your podcast on such a depressing, no, sad listen, note. <laughs> listen, I like, I actually just like you were saying that now because I actually saw something beautiful in that what you just mentioned now because, like you said um they teased you because of how you look you know you you were the skinny little guy and everything like that they were saying now nah, you're not man enough and you were into drama and all of that stuff that was back then and that was kind of like seen as like that was the downfall to you but look at you today that's the strongest thing about you the fact that you're so different the fact that you use who you are your body your character everything like that, it helps in when you're doing your when you're doing yourself you know you play as a skinny guy you're not playing as I'm a, a big butch guy or whatever you play as a skinny guy who used to be weird and corky and queer and it comes out in your material and stuff like that and it's your strength now you're making money of it and you're inspiring people with the exact same things that people look down on you so like i say like you flipped it around completely and actually made it your strength you know, instead of trying to be buff or trying to be the the boy, the boy that everyone likes, you know, you're like, I'm going to keep doing me. I don't care how you see me. And in fact, one day you're going to come pay to see me being myself. So well, this, this is the sad thing, Lunga, is that I, I, uh, uh, I never thought um, I don't care what you think about me because the truth is I cared a lot. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. You, 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 you want you want people to think you're cool and whatever. I wish I could care less. I wish I cared less. Um, yeah. But unfortunately, you know, you only you only get to that point, but later in life. Yeah. 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 No, I, I I'm not saying that you uh, you you started off like that. I'm saying what yeah 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 so bad about has become your strength now. You know. Yes. 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 So, you go out and say, I'm skinny and I'm funny and I'm quirky, you know, and I'm quirky and all of that stuff. When they used to say to you in a derogatory yeah. way and I bring it out like, this is what I am, Ika Skalki, you know? Yeah, and yeah. That's what makes you special. That's what makes you special and makes you really good at your thing. Skalk, it's been amazing having you on the Price of Fame. Thank you so much for availing yourself. You. My producer is going to kill me for going a bit over time. But no, I enjoyed it. And I'm sure in, in I was talking to you. 
<laughs> Have you enjoyed the experience of the Price of Fame? Yeah, thank you, man. I I loved it. Thank you. So But, nice. Um, is there anything you. else that you want to say to the up and coming? Anyone who's watching this right yes. now? Any few last famous words before I let you go? Um, hustle. Just hustle. <laughs> That's really my advice. Like you just that you have to. This industry, what we do, you have to fucking hustle. <laughs> you can't sit on. You can't just sit and yo wait for things to happen. You have to hustle. I mean, just this, just this podcast is a great example of just it's like hustling. You're not sitting on your ass waiting for, you know. It's like this is this is hustling. Lacquer man. Skulk, please for the um for the viewers who don't know about you just yet and actually just learned about you today, where can they find you on your social platforms? Can they be part of your journey? Please let us know what's coming up next. And we are where are you so alive with all your videos and everything like that on your social platforms? Can you just drop it uh, real quick? Yeah, Instagram and Facebook. Facebook just my page, Skulk Beside Note. Uh, Instagram at Skulky Bears, and uh, that is where I post my videos. That is where I advertise my shows. So that's where you find me. Skulk, a.k.a. Charlie Chapman, you've been amazing Thank tonight. You. Thank you so much for your time. Not tonight, this afternoon. I'm so used to doing <laughs> this in the evening. <laughs> so thank you so much, Skulk. May you have a lovely day further and good luck with your journey and everything. And I'm looking forward to sharing the stage with you again sometime soon. Thanks, man. Me too. Appreciate it. Cheers, buddy. Good. Okay. Have a good day. Bye. You too. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your patience and thank you for joining the Price of Fame. Like I said, we do this every single Tuesday. Okay, I didn't say that before, but I'm saying it now. For those of you watching for the first time, we have the show every single Tuesday. If you've missed out on any of the previous episodes, this is episode 20. If you missed out on any of the previous episodes, you can go onto my YouTube page and you can find all the episodes there. That is Lunga Chuka, my YouTube page. All the episodes are on there. I've featured some amazing guests on the show and I intend to keep doing so. So thank you so much with your support because that's what keeps me going as well. Uh, for those of you who don't know me and like to get in contact with me, find out about my gigs and what I'm busy with, and just be part of my journey, you can catch me on Facebook. That is Lunga Chuka, the Energizer Funny. That's Lunga Chuka, the Energizer Funny. On Instagram and on Twitter, you can catch me at Lunga Chuka. That's at Lunga Chuka. For the Price of Fame exclusive interviews and links to the interviews, the rest of the interviews that you can find on, on YouTube, you can go to my page. It's, uh, it's my The Price of Fame ZA. That's also on Instagram. And that is The Price of Fame ZA. You can check that out for exclusive interviews and snippets of the interviews that I've previously done. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, thank you so much. My name is Lunga Chuka. I've been your host, and this is The Price of Fame. Mm -hmm.